ethical uh, decision trees. So this is the first question of, all right, I'm trying to achieve a certain objective. How do I get there? Uh, so we have a number of trees to try to make it as simple as possible uh, with yes, no questions uh, or simplified questions to see how can the technology be deployed to get me to my goal. After that, uh, we uh, move on to sort of which technology should I choose? And for this, we have developed uh, a technology database. So we uh, collected information from the technology providers themselves, but also from the industry and from researchers that have worked with those technologies. We've also looked through um, publications discussing this and also uh, through discussion with operators that had uh, deployed those technologies in a real life uh, situation. Um, with all those information, we uh, tried to summarize and provide data sheets uh, for 51 technologies. Of course, uh, when an operator gets 51 technology data sheets, that's a bit much. Not all of them might be relevant. And so we have this database alongside its filtering tool that allows for operators to narrow down um, which technologies might be interesting for them so that they have sort of just a few data sheets where the information is summarized in a relatively standardized way for operators to be able to compare the performance uh, and the information available on different technologies. Um, so the first part, uh, going more into the details of it, of this project was to look at decision trees. Basically, we start from the question that the operator is asking, what is my goal? What is it that I'm trying to achieve? Is it first to just reduce emissions or do I both want to reduce emissions and report them, let's say, following regulatory reporting? Um, and for that, we then have a series of practical trees. Not all the trees sort of apply to uh, all the situations, but depending on the questions, as you can see on the, on the side of the screen, depending on the questions that are asked, there's a number of trees that are relevant. So we first have a, a very general overview tree, and there's a tree that looks into uh, site and source screening, um, then one that looks specifically at source quantification. So that would be which quantification method do I use for my source? We look at site quantification, and then there are two trees on reconciliation of source level and site level emissions. Uh, we'll have in the case study that we're gonna share with you at the end, sort of a more practical example on how those trees can be used to answer different questions, um, trying to be a bit less theoretical in that next part. Uh, then the next um, section was these data sheets uh, that we've mentioned. So here we have sort of two examples of data sheets. Again, in the case study, we'll go more into detail into um, one of them. And so here, what we see is that we have, uh, we cover a number of topics for all types of technologies. So first providing some general information, some technical specifications, um, trying to detail the constraints on the environmental conditions in which the technologies can operate, um, location conditions as well, uh, to provide some more information on the deployment. For example, how easy is it to deploy or not? Uh, do we need access to sites? Does my personnel need specific training to be able to deploy the technology? And then also all the links to the additional information. Now, what's important here is that um, I don't know if it's too small or not, you'll see that there are a whole lot of numbers on the side uh, of the screen here. And these refer to the type of information or the source of the information. So this is because, and I'm sure you'll all agree with me, um, sort of the marketing information from the technology provider might not always be reflected in the experience of operators who have deployed the technology. And so for that, depending on the information that was available, we tried to very transparently reference where the information was coming from. Is it the technology provider themselves that have said it? Is it something that was uh, published as part of a peer review journal article and that can be considered relatively independent? Does it come from the experience of 
operators or service providers that sort of don't have any stakes um, with the technology, but have deployed it at some of their sites. Um, and so all this is summarized in here so that not only do we have comparable information, but also there's a very clear view on where the information is coming from, trying to transparently uh, provide this information to operators. So here it goes into a bit more detail on how each of those data sheets were presented uh, and developed. So um, first, there was, of course, an interview with the technology provider, just making sure that they were willing to participate and then for them to give us the first view on their technology and on what the technology could achieve. Then we would sort of uh, draft the data sheet, have it reviewed by the provider, just to make sure that we didn't say anything that was technically incorrect. Uh, and then it was reviewed by the project uh, task force, so by the operators themselves, basically, and then the data sheet was finalized. Throughout that process, as we just mentioned, we didn't only include information from the technology providers. Uh, otherwise, you can just take a look at their website or ask them for their marketing brochure. Um, but we also tried to integrate, where possible, uh, information from independent research and also from the industry directly to try to make it as close to sort of field conditions as possible and not just lab testing. So here, there's a bit more information on the technology filtering tool. Um, I'm sure you're really curious about it, and I think I'll keep you on the edge of your seats uh, for now, because we're going to take a very close look at it during the case study towards the end, uh, and so we'll be able to share it. What's interesting for you, I think, is um, that this filtering tool is publicly available, just like the rest of the report and the data sheets, and so this is something that you'll be able to play around with. Um, if you have a, if you want to take a look at it, if you want to check the technologies that are in there and get more information. Maybe I can ask my colleague Damon to put the link in the chat if ever anyone uh, can't stand the the cliffhanger uh, moment here and wants to already go and have a quick look at it. So what we've seen from sort of this report, uh, and providing some some general points on it, uh, and this is the information that is available in the report. In case you're curious, um, is that we provide a whole lot more description than what is in the filtering tool on the different criteria that can be used to sort of look into technologies. Maybe not all of them are very relevant for you, but some of them might be. And so here, the first idea is to detail. Um, then in this report. Um, there is a, a section on all the different decision trees, which altogether we call the forest, um, detailing sort of these different processes to answer the questions operators might have uh, and sort of the path to follow to achieve a certain goal, depending on the situation, depending on what types of sources are present, depending on the outcome of different um, quantification exercise or detection exercise. Uh, and so that's all in the report, not only the visual decision tree, but also for those that are maybe a bit less visual, there's also a text description of these decision trees. Uh, the report also integrates real life case studies uh, from operators where they made use of a combination of technologies. Um, and so these are sort of describing how they came to combining these technologies, what was the added value for them, what were the challenges that they had to overcome. And so all this is uh, available in the report. And then finally, uh, we also discuss in the report uh, some general uh, elements to take into consideration when looking at detection and quantification technologies. Uh, so that's linked to sort of uncertainty. We know there's a lot more talk about reconciliation uh, in which uncertainty plays a big role. So there's some elements of, on that, uh, also sort of data management and security, uh, the changes in internal practices, and also how to interpret test results. And so all that is in this publicly available report, just trying to give you a bit of a taste of it uh, to try to make you curious to, to go and have a look and see if there's anything that is applicable to the upstream sector and has been detailed for the upstream sector, but that could also 
um, I think in a number of cases apply to your work uh, more in the mid and downstream uh, segments of the industry. The cool thing with this project is that it doesn't end here. We do realize that sort of this uh, these data sheets and this filtering tool is currently just a snapshot of what the detection and quantification uh, technology industry looks like at the moment. We also know, and I'm sure you've also noticed it, this is a very fast moving space. There are technologies that are here now that three years ago we uh, didn't even dream of. So the idea here is to have an ongoing process where we keep the, um, especially the filtering tool and the data sheets, uh, what we say evergreen, so keeping them updated, adding new technologies as they come in, removing if ever some are dropped, and also updating sort of technical specifications or even test results um, as these come in. Uh, after that, we also moved on to look into other types of technologies, a bit still in the methane space, but a bit beyond. So player technologies, which my colleague Damon will talk to us about uh, very soon. We also have the idea to update the decision trees. Uh, right now, they're quite, let's say, OGMP centric, um, but we know that there are other uh, volunteer initiatives out there and that some operators might be interested in it. So it would be to update to include um, GTI Veritas protocols in there. Um, and then, yes, just keeping those data sheets and the, the filtering tool uh, updated continuously with the new developments on the market. We hand it over now. I think, think, think yeah, I think yep. you, that's been that's been quite a lot of quite a lot of talking. So um, why don't I I'll help out for now. The um, so yeah, as Manon mentioned, so the initial project scope with OGCI, IOGP, and IPICA for the recommended practices for for methane emissions detection and quantification technologies. So initially covered, uh, so it wasn't specifically looking at um, um, technologies for flare destruction or combustion efficiency measurements. Uh, so those weren't included in the initial scope of the work. However, um, earlier this year, um, so we sort of identified that gap and then the Energy Institute um, out of the UK uh, stepped in and um, had uh, proposed to create an, an extension to this scope of work uh, that will include recommended practices for flare technologies. And so it sort of fills that space where it would then be able to ensure that, for example, operators or regulators or anyone involved in the methane emissions, oil and gas space be able to be adequately informed of these technologies for um, methane emissions detection quantification. So while also um, sort of overall encompassing um, flare measurements. So, and again, this is a, so just a sort of a disclaimer. So this project or the flare measurement, so it's currently ongoing. Um, we're sort of in the final stages of this. Um, and that, um, so I see this October, November, 2023, that's uh, slightly outdated at this point, but we're looking sort of towards um, the en end of the year where this is, where this would be something that's made available as part of sort of this overall scope of technology uh, recommendations. Um, and so a little bit of background on the importance of flares and uh, their emissions in the oil and gas industry. So as you're all well aware, so flaring, it's the burning of undesirable or surplus gas. So it's an open atmosphere flame. Um, so rather than venting it direct, directly to the atmosphere, uh, it's flared so that the, the gases, which often include high percentages of methane, are converted to carbon dioxide um, since methane has a much higher global warming potential than carbon dioxide. So it's preferable that if, if the emissions are, if they are emitted, that they're emitted as CO2 rather than as methane. Um, however, so depending on who you on who you ask or what the year is, there's about 150 billion cubic meters of gas that's flared. Um, number's probably a little lower for 2021, but um, in general, so that means, what that means is that there's a lot of gas being flared um, and so there's lots of potential for climate impact. Um, uh, so there's, you know, it's the motivation for initiatives such as the World Bank Zero Routine Flaring Program. But what also comes into play is this 
um, this assumption of a 98% combustion efficiency. So um, sort of an, the industry expectation that a normally operating flare is going to be 98% efficient. Um, but in some cases, especially when you consider, so if there is fluctuations or changes in flared volumes or what if the gas composition is different, uh, flare design is it a is it a just a an unengineered pipe flare? Is there is it a you know multi-tipped engineered um, design with steam or air assist? Um, how it's operated, you know, in periods of high high or low flow conditions. What about wind or you know how old the flare is? How do all these sort of um, factors come into play and how do they how do they impact this combustion efficiency? So um, just bringing that back to that 150 billion cubic meters of gas. So that could be significant, especially when conditions aren't optimal. Um, what ends up, what does that combustion efficiency end up being? And what are the associated emissions uh, related to flaring? Um, so just as sort of a background and motiv motivation for um, why flare measurements of flare combustion efficiency are, are relevant and why they're, you know, important in determining a, you know, an, an understanding of methane emissions or an, an emissions inventory. So techniques and applicability for flare combustion efficiency and destruction removal efficiency measurements. So um, a lot of, so some of these, some of these technologies are originally covered in the initial um, uh, recommended practices document. So we could, we could say satellites. So there are, there are some satellites out there um, that, you know, if they're publicly available or private, um, they might be able to measure methane emissions coming from, you know, a large geographical area. Um, some might be able to pinpoint them down more specifically, but there are limitations just with, you know, relative sort of minimum detection thresholds where um, uh, they might be able to see unlit flares or large, very large flaring um, emission sources, but it doesn't have, I guess, the granularity or the sensitivity to be able to detect those, um, to detect emissions or, for example, to tell whether or not a player is measuring at 90 is, or is operating at 98% efficiency versus at 95% efficiency. Um, aircraft again, so um, I guess we could talk about aircraft and drones together where, depending on the, on the situation and with the sensors that are available. So um, having a, a sensor for methane and CO2 simultaneously um, could be able to sort of provide a, an estimate of combustion efficiency. Um, however, with these, uh, with these types, types of measurements, they're periodic. And so being able to understand what's happening through, throughout a year um, would be challenging just from you know, some very discrete measurements. Uh, fixed sensors as well, so when we can think of continuous monitoring solutions, um, are also, so again, with being able to measure methane or carbon or carbon dioxide, but um, again, depending on what the sensor setup is, there's, you know, the, the location of where these sensors are, um, isolating from between what's coming from a flare and what's coming from somewhere else. So again, it's not, um, it is not sort of a, I guess, a very straightforward, straightforward way. Um, and, you know, additional information and understanding has to go into it. Um, when we think about numerical models, so based on measured parameters to be able to make estimates of what flare combustion efficiency would be if you consider um, the crop or the, the wind speed or the flare gas composition or the size of the burner. So these models are available, but uh, the, prob the problem is that they're, um, so again, there are so many conditions where are these, are these models val valid for other, um, for other scenarios as well, and especially if they're, you know, lab scale derived and is, is that applicable for all scenarios? So there are many sort of different factors that go into those. And sort of related to that, we have predictive measurements, which again, would use some sort of modeling to be able to give an understanding or estimate of what's happening. But again, so the, the, um, the instrumentation required for that as well, um, it's based based on models that are 
um, again, need to be validated as well. But so all to say that these, all the technologies are, there are potential for these to be able to be used for flare combustion efficiency or destruction removal efficiency measurements, but um, they, they all have their advantages and limitations. So similar to with the, with the recommended practices for methane emissions in general, um, so the, the dat, a series of data sheets were created for flare uh, specific um, measurement technologies. And so it provides very similar information about general sort of general aspects, what, you know, what the sensor type is or um, where, how is it deployed? Is it on a, is it a fixed sensor? Is it a drone and whatnot? As well as other, you know, environmental conditions or location deployment information. And again, what we spoke about before, where all this information is linked to um, um, publicly available information or, or easily referenced um, for where the, where the information is coming from, just to be able to increase the transparency of these data sheets as well. Um, so the report, um, again, so it's an in introduction with a background on flaring, uh, a, a more in-depth review of what I had what I had spoke about a few slides ago, but looking at how the technologies and how they're applicable for measuring flare emissions, um, sort of mapping out the overview of the past and current research. Um, documentation for the data sheets and the and the database. So, um, similar to what the recommended practices, we also have a technology filtering tool that looks at flare specific um, measurement technologies. And so, um, it sort of provides a yeah, sort of an, an added added component to the initial technology filtering tool. But so it's st structured in a very similar way at this point. And then it sort of the again report uh, looks at sort of an analysis and availability of technologies as well. The, the so the flare technologies report was also um, was designed in that it would be applicable for use with um, use with the decision trees of the OGCI, IOGP, and IPCA uh, recommended practices. So, um, which were part of the initial scope. So, for example, in the emission source screening or when performing source level quantification or thinking about site level measurements or following up with reconciliation, um, the data sheets were structured in such a way that they would also be applicable for, for use when, you know, for example, by an operator who's looking to perform these and to be able to use these in practice. And so just a general sort of relevance for the recommended practices for flares as well. So. What we'd sort of seen from the um, in the sort of conducting this study. So again, it's ongoing and hopefully be able to be made late, available later this year. But what we've seen is that there's there is quite a lot of ongoing industry effort um, that's happening. So um, for example, and with uh, flare or source specific measurements of flares and in, in the in the North Sea. Um, Efficient flare efficiency studies that are going on, use of CFD at, off, at a certain offshore platforms, um, work on modeling and testing, and so um, yeah, there's there's quite a, quite a lot going on at this point, and so it's it's encouraging as well um, for especially with um, ongoing work that's you know complementary with OGCI, IHP, and IPCA, um, the uh, methane flaring toolkit as well as initiatives such as the world bank zero routine flaring program so all of these are sort of ongoing and um, sort of provide a complementary overview of um, being able to effectively measure um, me or measure and manage emissions from flares um, and so again with the technology so it is great it is be great to be able to measure the emissions and to be able to have a good understanding as well, but with a focus on mitigation. So that would be um, uh, again focusing on with, for example, reduced flare volumes um, in the in the case where flare volumes aren't able to be reduced. It's ensuring that the flare is operating properly so that it's you know there's no malfunctions, and that includes ensuring the flares are lit so that it's not only being able to measure, but in order to be able to 
making sure that when flaring is necessary, that it's happening at the best available sort of ability at this point. And so what we uh, have here, as uh, Damon just mentioned, is the idea for those two reports to actually be integrated together and work together as they cover very similar topics, even though the sources are slightly different. Um, so the decision trees um, that we discussed, uh, they uh, have been adapted to better reflect uh, and include these elements on flaring. Uh, the two technology databases will be integrated uh, to be able to filter through all technologies as one at, at once and not have to go through two different sites to get basically similar information. And then the data sheets will also be included. The data sheets are, of course, sort of uh, tailored for flaring, but still follow a similar uh, setup so that it makes the technologies comparable with other methane uh, technologies and easily understandable uh, with the same logic, basically, as the others. All right, I think that now we've gone a lot through uh, the theoretical side of things, and this might all be much more uh, easy to grasp with a real life example. Uh, so I'll let Damon start to walk us through uh, a little made up case that we've prepared for you to give you a better sense of how all these can, elements in the report can be used and how they work together. So in the case, for uh, perhaps being able to use this, um, you know, in, in you know, from theory to um, further on. So uh, it's starting from based on what is the the main objective of you know being or to measure emissions. Um, for example, is that for would be either for to reduce reducing methane emissions or um, if it's for reporting emissions for voluntary. For voluntary basis, if we think of, for example, OGMP or OGMP, you know, gold standard uh, eventually. So, in the case, we might say that there's Ali, the Ali, the process engineer who's been asked, works for a small oil company, has been asked to develop some sort of plan for uh, reaching OGMP gold, gold standard. And so, at this point, um, they could use the sort of this first general tree to decide. Okay, this is what I want to do, but then what am I what am I supposed to do for that? Do from there. Um, gold standard would mean that having a source level inventory and reconciling with the site level measurements to reach OGMP level five, which would mean that you there would have to be some sort of screening and understanding of components and sites, and to have an understanding of emission sources. From there, it's uh, performing a source level quantification for individual equipment. Um, as well as performing measurements for at the site level as well. And then because it's OGMP level five, it then, then means that there is some sort of reconciliation activity that occurs. And then from there, it, this, uh, this information can be used to ask, assess or prioritize emissions reductions. So if we go through that with that step from the steps from the last screen, so the first First aspect would be to be able to use sort of a site level screening to be able to understand, okay, what are the emissions sources? What are the emissions? Yeah, so what would be the emission sources that are available at each or potentially at, at the site? So if we say we're looking at a single, a, a first, you know, simple exercise where it's a single site, um, it's not logistically challenging or expensive to perform the screening. Um, it might involve someone, you know, going on site, taking a walk around, for example. And so from there, performing the source screening of the site, um, which means, yeah, developing a list of all sources, whether that's uh, leaks. So um, sources that aren't are unintentional releases, um, routine and process emission sources that might emit methane at regular operation or at sort of in, at scheduled intervals or on as well as unexpected emission sources, non-routine. So consider these incidents or malfunctions. And so the data sheets go through um, or the decision trees go through and sort of identify, okay, what are the potential emission sources? You know, if we think about them in terms of expected, unexpected, or 
um, yeah, unexpected incidents. And so providing sort of a good first step of what are, are all those emission sources are, and then to be able to then go forward and say, how do we, how are we going to quantify these? Um, so this one, so this is also part of the screening tool for, for continuous improvements as well. So um, uh, for being able to update or improve over time, what the emission sources are. So again, the decision tree just provides sort of um, uh, steps for con considerations for um, why um, an, an inventory might have to be updated or expanded on. And so, but I won't go into too much detail about this. Um, next would be performing a source level quantification. So, again, because we're looking at OGMP, uh, we want to perform uh, reconciliation de and develop a source level inventory. We have to consider things like materiality. Um, and making sure that we have all of our emission sources as well. And then repeating the process for all the potential identified emission sources as part of that screening. So in a case, um, say Ali, the engineer has gone through and they've identified, let's, we could say, call it three sources. Uh, so the first one being, um, if it's a, um, a source that is, um, Either highly highly cyclical or um, depending on um, might be uh, yeah challenging challenging to measure. In, in which case you would perform um, you would perform engineering calculations, um, and then so in the case of a um, let's say a compressor a compressor seal um, where you're unsure about the the sources as well. Um, um, depending on the loading, so with the measurements, performing those at different times of the cycle, um, and then being having a better understanding of what those are over time. Um, if we go to the next one again, so um, if it's a, a source where, again, if it's possible to measure um, for engineering calculations, um, it might also be possible as well in, in the case of a, um, it could be a, it could be tank, tanks or, or, or tank loading or, um, for that. It might also be challenging to perform measurements on them as well, because what if the tank has visible holes in the, in the roof? Um, so again, if we, we also have to consider health and safety. So maybe in this, in this case, it might be a better idea to perform engineering calculations. Um, All right. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we have several examples of this, but we're not going to yeah. keep you around too long. I think you get the concept that basically it's following these different steps to understand which is the best way to uh, quantify emissions following this decision tree. We then also have something similar for site level quantification. Um, this is a bit less detailed because also uh, sort of constraints on technologies and aspects like that, but it does provide more information on what are the things to pay attention to, which type of technologies um, can be used in which situations and what is important when choosing the site level uh, quantification method. Um, so here we have those two aspects that are in the sort of decision tree. This one is probably the one that looks like, like a tree, but more like a bush. And so you have this information there to know what are the relevant elements to take a look at. Um, maybe we want to uh, take a look at the technology filtering tool. Um, so let's say Ali, the engineer, um, went through, saw that uh, they had a number of sources that they had to quantify uh, using measurements. Uh, let's imagine um, that this is sort of source level. Uh, let's try to take something more practical and take a look at it. So now, finally, after keeping you all uh, on this cliffhanger, this is the technology filtering tool and what it looks like. So as an operator, uh, we can start having a look. Um, in some cases, Ali, the engineer, doesn't have any preference. Um, so they might say, do I want access to site? Oh, it doesn't matter so much. Um, 
what type of business model maybe Ali the engineer doesn't have a strong opinion. Um, but then maybe uh, because of either company policy or knowing that this is not going to be a satisfactory quantification method, maybe Ali the engineer says, all right, I'm going to take out satellites because this is not uh, relevant for me or this is not something that I want to get into. Especially if it's a source of low quantification, maybe it's a sort of a, a, an assumption. Yeah, maybe at this point, um, I might be better off with something that's not mm -hmm. a satellite yeah. for a source level. Yeah. Then there's a number of uh, information on the sort of area characteristics. So depending on where Ali's site is located, uh, luckily for Ali, he lives in a place uh, that is, or he works in a place that is uh, onshore, far away from water, where there's typically no uh, snow coverage. He's lucky enough to have sort of a, a quite nice weather in his area. So there's limited uh, cloud coverage and precipitation. So all these aspects, Ali doesn't need to take into account um, to uh, choose uh, a technology to do his source level quantification. So then the idea for Ali is that he uh, wants to do this uh, source level. So that means that um, I want technologies as Ali to be able to detect at component and uh, equipment level, it could be. Same for uh, quantification, which is what we were looking at. So these are the two. Um, but then Ali, the engineer, um, they think that uh, it's likely that the, the emissions are quite low, that there's a, a quite low emission rate because of this source level uh, element and because uh, the facility is well maintained, so they don't expect it to be very high. Uh, so they will select here to choose to have a detection threshold that's 10 kilograms per hour or lower. And so Ali, the engineer, wants to filter out all the technologies with that. So saving time to not have to assess all of them if ever their detection threshold is higher and will likely not be uh, super helpful in this case. Um, and then there's a, a number of sort of last uh, checks uh, that Ali can choose to run if ever they want to have specifically um, technologies that have been um, tested by um, by third parties or by academics uh, and that have been validated in case, as we said, Ali is part of a small oil company uh, that might not always have the resources or the people with the relevant knowledge to perform those assessments. So they would rather play it safe and uh, have those. But let's say in this case, Ali just wants general information and wants to take a look at it. So here we end up from the list of 51 with three technologies for Ali to review. So we can take a look um, at one of them. So just by clicking on them, this uh, provides Ali with the data sheet, which of course is opening on my other screen, um, that looks like this. Uh, so this is where there's all the information that Ali can review. And the structure is the same for all technologies. So Ali can easily compare all of them and can get more information. So even if Ali did sort of select a certain detection threshold, there's more information on that. There's information on the validation of those thresholds. Um, there's also some aspects that aren't necessarily available in the, um, in the filtering tool that are sort of more general. For example, how easy is it to deploy? Uh, is there sort of prior uh, training required? Um, what type of sources does it typically work best on if that information is available. And then Ali can also go and take a look directly at some other information uh, if Ali is interested in learning more. All right, I'll uh, close this and then I'll let uh, Ali continue uh, their uh, reconciliation exercise. Yeah, so at this point, so once we have our source level inventory, um, it would again be then saying, um, so thinking about OGMP level five, uh, performing a, a site level measurement for either a single site or, you know, if it's a group of equipment, 
group of equipment for a single point in time. And so, um, so then having an understanding of for each mission source the inventory, so um, sort of having a general idea of what are the potential um, technologies that could be used um, for determining a, a site level, a site level measurement. So the, the in performing a, a site level measurement, it builds on the information from having a source level inventory and sort of having a general general under understanding of um, if you were to perform a measurement, what would you expect to see? Um, that would then be able to inform other um, sort of the use of technologies um, for that. And then in having a reconciliation be between looking between the two of them um, to understand um, um, understand what's what's occurring at the time of it, how do they compare, and overall, how do I Im identify discrepancies and improve those? So again, we have a series of sort of decision trees or decisions to go through, and based on the results of the comparison between the two measurements, how can this information be used to uh, to be able to help improve those emission sources? Um, so again, um, we have different options for how the Sort of the overlap at a specific point in time of how those um, of how those two measurement techniques compare. How can they be used to yeah? If there are missing emission sources, if there are discre discrepancies in source level quantification, to be able to have some sort of continuous improvement over time. And so again, based on the results of this and where the tree sort of takes you down through through the branches, um, it sort of providing recommendations of, okay, we've done the reconciliation, what now? And so, again, because it's sort of a continual improvement that um, it's meant to be an iterative process that, um, that would be um, able to help improve over time. Uh, what is the, yeah, sort of how the reconciliation then can then sort of uh, spur on emissions reductions and better understanding of methane emissions as well. But um, I think that's that was it from that's it for us the case study. I, I appreciate that it's uh yeah there's probably a lot to take in as well, um, especially with a very simplified sort of case study. But I would encourage you all to um, if you're interested to go find find that report, check out the filtering tool, look at the database and decision trees and um, yeah. Yep, and in the shorter term, um, we're really curious to hear what you think about it um, and also to answer any of the questions you may have, um, but I'll leave it up uh, to Carolina to, to continue and, uh, and to let us know if there's anything that has come up. First of all, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. I was kind of concerned what we're going to do with one hour, but now I see that it can be hour and a half as well. And congratulations for the work, because uh, it seems really like like very detailed and, and useful tool, not like reports on practice and, and, and this is it and, and uh, we can go further. So I will open the, the floor for, for questions. I didn't see any in chat, but uh, you can you can raise your hand now and unmute yourself and and put the, the question since we have our excellent uh, speakers and experts here and really those who were involved in, in, in uh, development of, of this tool. So shall shall I read it because uh, I see the question from from uh, Michael. Let's... Yeah. So I I don't mind. I can I can read that out and yeah. then uh, we can dealing with uh, two screens, so it's not easy. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, if if you see the so, question, please answer. Yeah. So with the various sensors available in respect of manufacturers, how do you manage the timing for updating the tool database? This is as sensors improve to the providers input their updated information, or do you solicit the updates? So that's a great question. Um, so this again, um, so for a little bit of, of context as well, this report um, was published in uh, late, late September. Um, it was earlier this year that sort of a lot of the information was finalized, which included the information for the data sheets. And so, um, we are, again, um, as Manal mentioned, thinking about how do we keep these data sheets updated and how do we keep them evergreen so that they're relevant as well. 
Um, so there's ongoing discussions for, for how we do this as well. Um, it is absolutely our goal uh, to be able to do it. But for, and then for the question as well, I think between soliciting the updates versus providers inputting their updated, inf updated information, it's a bit of both. So, um, because we're, we're well aware that there's many uh, providers who are, uh, you know, sort of going through continued testing, um, who've reached out to us already since the update of the report. Um, we're also aware of ones who haven't, but we know that we want to we want to talk to. And so, um, yeah, so it's a bit of both, but all with sort of with the goal of that we want to keep this information updated because in the end, updated information is sort of the is is what will benefit. Um, an operator or someone who's interested in using it. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for answer and actually confirming that there is a plan that is going to be updated. I mean, the report and the tool is going to be updated kind of on continuous basis. So I believe you have already agreement with with the, with the organizations which are founding this this tool. So yes. that's correct. So this is still under discussion. Um, our hope is to start the update process early next year. I believe once uh, let's say the first round has been completed, and then we can sort of enter a new phase of the project, which is more the upkeep uh, of those data sheets and of the filtering tool. And also maybe. Uh, do you plan some extension of, of uh, database, technology database, actually, because technology is, is running? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's correct. So we see here that there was a focus on technologies that uh, are targeted towards upstream and then extended to uh, flaring technologies. It's definitely uh, of interest to even broaden the scope. We do realize that there's a number of technologies that uh, you all here probably know much better uh, than we do at this stage, which are all the midstream and downstream sort of pipe uh, and pipeline uh, detection and quantification technologies for methane emissions. And so this is definitely something that could very well complement um, the current report and also sort of the data sheets and filtering tool. Um, this we do not have funding for at the moment, but I think this is definitely of interest of the existing organizations to uh, extend and to be able to integrate that to make it a more comprehensive tool that is actually interesting for the entire um, industry rather than only for upstream and trying to sort of open the gates there to make it more inclusive. So thank you. <laughs> it, it looks promising. I mean, because it's really I see it comprehensive and useful tool like like mist. I mean, also produced by by carbon limits. So for for that, uh, actually, when you will have now, I don't know, question. So one technology to be recommended. <laughs> could you could you answer, or it's not possible to answer in that way? I th so I think that's yeah. It is a very good question, and so again, I think it would be. It I would love to be able to say that there is that there is one you know one answer as well, but I think um, partially it's to do with sort of on a case by case basis and how individual sites are set up. You know, you can think about how um, you know onshore production in the U.S. Um, could be a very different situation than somewhere you know large uh, large platform in the North Sea versus um, if we think about cent Central Asia. Uh, you know, a compressor station as well. There's just so many different variables, you know, whether that's, you know, the just the availability of the technology versus the, um, what are the potential emission sources sizes as well, that um, there's, yeah, lots of factors that go into it that we wouldn't be able to, wouldn't be able to say that this is the one technology um, that we would, you know, we would say definitely, definitely use. Um, but it's on a case by case, and sometimes that could in, could include combinations. Especially, you know, if we think about in terms of reconciliation, you need you need two technologies, anyways, to be able to to reconcile the the measurements together. I don't know if I missed anything. No, I think really overall, what this report has showed us is that um, a combination of technologies is definitely essential, and even within a limited geography or within a limited section of uh, operations, it could be that. 
uh, operators need several technologies just because they have different types of emission sources, just because the conditions are even slightly different. And so to reach a certain level of quality in the quantification, especially, but also in the detection, it can be very interesting to actually combine several of these together. Thank you. This, this is actually what I want to hear somehow as a conclusion, because, of course, there is no one single solution for, for all cases everywhere. And it sounds also as an invitation for all to explore and to have a look in the tool, in the report. And actually, this is the great thing, because this is already based on experience of many, many companies. So it's, there is no need for smaller company to enter and to, to explore everything by itself. So it's already tool, tool is, is there and experience can be shared. So we will we will publish uh, slides. We will provide the link to to report, and uh, it's also recorded. So you can have a look later on and and check what was not clear. Or and then, I believe also to approach uh, Manon and and Damon if you have more questions or or more interest in that. Uh, with that, uh, I would also. I would like to thank to all of you for following Meta Mondays, uh, to thank once again to our excellent presenters today. Uh, stay tuned, uh, maybe we will have one more Meta Monday this year uh, in a month's time. I think that it's 4th December is, is again Monday. So let's see and then let's see what we're going to do next year with our Meta Mondays. With that, Stay safe, stay well and healthy, and have a great November until December. Bye. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.